Hi, my name is Earl Wallace. Hello. Welcome, Earl. And tonight we're going to be talking about the biblical basis of the Bill of Rights. Can you repeat that? Yeah, the biblical, biblical basis, basis of the Bill of Rights. Last night we talked about the divine decalogue for dynamic decency. Can you repeat that? The divine decalogue for dynamic decency. It's not a board. Hey, we're going to talk about natural law. One slide, big talk. Then we're going to talk about how natural law is the founding father's value system, and that's really the natural law is rooted in the Ten Commandments. And then we're going to talk about how the Bill, how the Bill of Rights is, a, is an extension of natural law. We're going to talk about the constitutional role of American churches. And we're really going to focus a lot on Amendment Number 1. Yes, ma'am? I didn't get a picture. Madeline? <laughs> so, you missed somebody. Just sit down. That's why. You just sat down. <laughs> Madeline, you're still working alone? Yeah. No. Hey, she had helpers. She had helpers? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Madeline's learning how to delegate? Yeah. You delegate so your organization's uh, uh, productivity inflates. Yes, sir. What's natural law? Natural law is the law that God gives you, gives us. You know, I like to think of gravity as a natural law. You know, God is consistent with 2 plus 2 equals 4. We'll get, we'll get to that. And then we're going to talk about what we lost, what went wrong, why is America in the position that it's in. Um, I'm going to get started here. Natural law equals the natural law equals the Ten Commandments. You don't have a fill in here. When a slide turns, look for the underlined word and just write that word in. What's the underlined word on this slide? God. God. There we go. You guys are quick. In the ninth century, King Alfred the Great acknowledged that God gives us rights, and he codified them into English law. This code actually began with a recitation of the Ten Commandments. Later, Bible-believing pilgrims, I mean uh, Puritans, came from England uh, to, to escape the tyrannical uh, kings. We heard a lot about that a couple of days ago. And uh, these Puritans escaped religious persecution. And in the New World, they got a chance to say, Wow, God, how do you want us to live? And they looked at the Bible, and they began developing a, uh, a, a code, a system of civil uh, life, based upon the Bible. And what's and look at on the, on the right-hand side of the screen. Our legal views are freedom of speech, the press, exercise of religion, no self-incrimination, independence of the jury, that means the jury is not connected to the king and doesn't have to make a decision under, under a duress from the king or, or the legal authorities, and imprisonment only after due process. We're all established in the new world. And, but those principles actually came from the old world. Let's talk about how these principles are America's value system. They're the founding fathers' value system, the biblical basis of the Bill of Rights. You see a fill-in word there? It would be? Now, the founding fathers esteemed the Bible, and they understood that through the Ten Commandments, God secures our unalienable rights. So in the Bill of Rights, they stipulate how government should cooperate with God's plan by conducting itself in ways that do not interfere with our ability to honor them and obey them as God desires. So what did they realize? They realized that commandments one through four, which we looked at last night, are all about your relationship with God. So in the First Amendment, they said, hey, we're going to let you worship. We're going to make sure you can worship God the way the Bible says. Commandment five is all about honoring your family, your parental rights, and your inheritance rights. I don't like Obamacare because it says that we got to get enough young people to sign up to pay for the old. All of us old people, we work two or three jobs to pay for you kids. We don't want our kids paying for us. Um, so I think Obamacare, they're, they're, twisting, they're twisting what scripture desires for people. Um, numbers, uh, commandment number six, the founding fathers realized that you have a right not to be murdered. They realized from through commandment number seven, you have a right to safeguard your property and not, and not to be molested. Uh, commandment number eight, uh, you have a right to not have your property stolen or improperly seized. Commandment number nine, you have a right not to be lied to or about. And commandment number ten, you have a right not to have government coveting your person, your people, or your possessions, or your position in life. Now, George Washington added to his first oath of office these words spontaneously, so help me God, and he kissed the Bible. I told you about this before, right? George Washington was not making a perfunctory prayer. He was saying, this is a new nation, this is a new experiment. God, help me. And so um, the Lord did. That's why we won the revolution, I believe. Anyway, George Washington declared in his farewell address, both reason and experience, that means everything I think about and everything I've experienced and know about, 
uh, both forbid us to expect that the national morality can prevail in exclusion of religious principles. Why were they so concerned about morality? You know, if you're free, did you get your fill in there? No. You can't see it? Those of you who can't see, please move over here. There's going to be a lot of fill-ins. I mean, your, your page is full of fill-ins. You're going to have to move. Okay. Morality is the fill-in. Hmm? Oh, morality is not a fill-in. Right? No, morality is not a fill-in. Uh, I was from a previous presentation. I put it in there and I, meant, I went through it and I thought I got them all out. So, so far, you got one on. Hey, I know this is terribly exciting, but do try to control yourselves. Morality is not a feeling. There's no feeling on this slide either. John Adams, we're going to look at the bottom. He said that our Constitution is designed only for a what? And it is wholly inadequate for any other. You know why? Because if you're free and you choose not to live by the Ten Commandments, you're going to hurt a lot of people. But if you and I want to make a business deal and we both decide not to steal, we don't need government. That's what the Founding Fathers were hoping for. I'm going to explain that. Look at what James Madison said. Let's just read the bold first. He said, we have staked the whole future of American civilization, the future of all of our political institutions, upon the capacity of each and all of us to govern ourselves according to the Ten Commandments of God. You got a fill in here. What would that be? Intertwined. intertwined. The Bible and the U.S. Constitution are so intertwined in the minds of the Founding Fathers that they gave us the tradition of swearing upon one that we would uphold the other. Mm, that's good. Intertwined. Intertwined. Got it? No. If you're not writing, you're wrong. If you are writing, you're all right. <laughs> and guess what the Founding Fathers did? Uh, they wrote the Bill of Rights and they established the USA as one nation under God. The Founding Fathers wrote what? What was that document called? To who? King George III? Yeah, it's right there in the slide. Oh, there's a slide up there. America's Founding Fathers wrote the Declaration of Independence, which mentions God how many times from you fill in? Four times, and it told King George, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. This is the American way. And that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men. Here's what he was saying. You've got three fill-ins on the bottom. They are gives, can't, and cooperate. You with me? Yes. God gives us our rights. Rulers can't take them away. And what is government designed to do in God's eyes? Cooperate with God by safeguarding the rights that He gives us. I'm going to go back and make sure you get those fillings. When you have all your fillings, you're going to tap your pen on your head or something. I don't know what you're doing. Hey, you got a fill in here. What's the word? What's the fill in? You know what inalienable or unalienable means? It means that it can't be separated. You, we can't be separated from those rights. Unalienable or inalienable is an adjective. It's an adjective describing a principle of ownership of a right. It means whatever is inalienable or unalienable is absolutely essential. It's invaluable. It's non-negotiable, non-transferable. It's sacrosanct. And I got untransferable as well as non-transferable. I tried to put them all in alphabetical order. Now, the Founding Fathers emphasized biblical morality because they're going to trust us with freedoms, and if people aren't moral and they're free, then bad things happen. The foundation of our liberty is really biblical morality. Now, the Bible and the U.S. Constitution are so intertwined that government cannot break one of the Bill of Rights, rights without also breaking at least one of the Ten Commandments and vice versa. So your fill-ins are break and break and breaking. If you can spell the first word, just add ing to it. Yes, ma'am. Why is number ten underlined? Oh, it's another one of my. Uh, so that's two. I always. 
10 is a mistake. I pulled the slide from another presentation where I had handouts there, I'm probably writing in the word 10. Hey, let's just review the 10 commandments. Commandment number one, God is number one, treat all people as number twos. Commandment number two, we imitate God versus imitating our idols. Commandment number three, do we esteem God's name? Do we treat it like a G-O-D versus a? G-O-D. Be a Sabbath seeker is number four. That means daily seek God. Be faithful to your fellow family members. Can you guys say that? Be faithful to your fellow family members. Just remember that the next time your little brother or sister is a little bit irritating. Uh, mercy mitigates murder is commandment number six. What, what is commandment number seven if you? Right. You? And commandment number eight, stealing rips us out of God's plan. What about command, commandment number nine? There's two parts to it. 9A is the? And slander sells us short. That's good. And what is commandment number 10? Coveting clouds the conscience. Contentment cools cravings. Now let's apply these 10 commandments to our, uh, see how the founding fathers anyway, applied these 10 commandments within the Bill of Rights. Remember, commandments number one through four tell, teach us how to manage our relationship with who? God. The, the only feeling you have is at the top. You don't have God, you don't have family, you don't have society. Relationships. Just relationships. It's a big word. I think I gave you enough space to fit it in there. As long as you're not trying to write like 14 font. You, you guys can all write within the lines, right? We're past that, right? Yeah. So commandment number five manages our relationship with our family, and obviously commandment six through ten manages our relationship with God and society. You want to do on that? Thing? Oh, I want to. I want to emphasize this. And family. Government is to secure our rights to manage God the relationships in both our personal and our political lives, according to the Ten Commandments. Here's the Bill of Rights. You got five fill-ins here. What are the five fill-ins? What's number one? Religion. What's number two? Speech. What's number three? Press. What's number four? Assembly. And what's number five? Contention. Uh-uh. What's uh, underlined? Redress. Redress. I'm going to give you a moment to write those in, and I'm going to talk while you're writing. The Bill of Rights in Amendment Number One, the Founding Fathers secure our rights to obey commandments number one through four. That's why they gave us the freedom of religion. They're trying to say that you have the right to worship God the way he wants you to worship him. They also said that speech should, religion should guide speech. What we consider wholesome speech, it's what religion says wholesome speech is. If the newspaper is going to report crime, it should be about what the Bible calls sin. Uh, the Founding Fathers also said that these principles should be freely published, published throughout the press. The Bible is supposed to be the conscience of society. The press was supposed to be the watchdog of society. And there was, a, like 35 years ago, you could open up the Sunday newspaper and the Sunday, the, 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 your local paper would take turns publishing full sermons of the, the various pastors throughout our community. When TV was first invented, it was a big box with a little picture. And at night, I guess the television would end at about midnight or some, some communities even earlier. But there would be the national anthem playing and the flag would be waving. And under the flag, there would be Bible verses flowing. So freedom of the press. They also gave us the freedom to assemble. And you know what they really wanted us to do? They wanted us to have Bible studies in churches everywhere. Because they said, if we can't get Americans to understand the Bible and to and live by the Ten Commandments, our experiment in freedom is going to go down the tubes very quickly. And they also said they want to give us the right to redress our grievances to the government. In other words, what they're saying is, if your government strays from the biblical basis of the Bill of Rights, Go in mass and drag your government back onto that path. Bill of Right number two. The Founding Fathers realized that commandment number six gives us the right to not be what? Which is your fill-in. And that's why they gave us amendment number two, the right to bear arms. We have a right to safeguard against another person or the government plotting against us, to kill us in a premeditated manner. And I believe this applies to preborn babies in the womb. We're going to fight abortion until we, until the Lord comes and gets us. Uh, the Bill of Right number two safeguards your right not to be murdered. There are no other fill-ins for this section. But Bill of Rights three and four, conditioning of soldiers. Uh, soldiers can't barge into your home and just say, hey, we're going to spend the night here. They can't use the NDA to make that happen. You know why? Because commandment number eight says, 
government can't steal your home or violate your personal space by barging in and saying soldiers are going to stay in your house, commandeer your food, etc., and harass your family. We have a right against search and seizure. Those, those, that, that process is highly regulated, in my opinion, by the U.S. Constitution. Government can't covet your possessions and seize them under false pretenses like high taxes or you know, making a, a, an Obamacare law that is really just designed to transfer wealth. Do you know that this illegal immigration thing, the illegal immigrants coming over the border, they're stealing citizenship. They don't want the you. They don't want the uh, peace on earth, goodwill to men, uh, the nativity scene, the national anthem, and God we trust anywhere. But when it comes to them violating the Ten Commandments in the name of their agenda, now it's Christian to do so. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm. And the only way they can get away with it is, is if we don't know these principles, which we are learning. So anyway, look at these uh, com a bill of right number five. It protects you against prosecution. There's provisions and procedures. And also, you have the right to a speedy trial, a trial by witnesses of your peers. I'm not really afraid of the government because if they're going to try me by a jury of my peers, they've got to find a five inch, nine and a half, five foot, nine and a half inch black guy who's married to a white woman who plays guitar, <laughs> who has an MBA, and who wrote a book. No. Come <laughs> on. I should be. I got a feeling they're not going to go down the list and check all those off. Uh, and we have a right to a trial by jury of our peers. Uh, there's no excessive bail or cruel punishment. Now, why did the founding fathers give us that? It's because commandments number 7, 8, 9, and 10 say this. 9 and 10, government can't lie to us or about us, can't sneak around and spy on us, nor manipulate to defraud us, rob us through excessive bail, nor detain us indefinitely if we can't pay. Commandments 7, 8, and 9, government can't arrest us, detain us secretly. It must be upon public notice by, with due process by our peers. Here's the rule of construction of the Constitution, number, uh, amendment number nine. You can't make an amendment that violates any other right. Com and, uh, amendment number 10, the states and the people have rights not expressly uh, given to the federal government, which has, what's your two feelings? Limited, Limited and enumerated. Numerated. Limited and enumerated powers. We're going to talk a bit about that. Here's what's going to happen when we get to heaven. God's going to hold us accountable for, for violations of his Ten Commandments, even if it's done by a majority vote. Just because Congress gets together and decides to vote for something doesn't mean God is not going to judge us. You know what? The people that want to parade up homosexuality up and down the street, they're jeopardizing my grandkids. They're, caught, they're putting us on a path that God has no choice but to judge. And I intend to protect my family against it. Come on. Now, and we too should hold politicians and government to the same standard. Let's not accept these unbiblical practices uh, by people who hide behind saying, oh, we're just going to take care of the poor, or we're, we're doing it for the kids, or we're doing it for education, or whatever. What does it mean by enumerated and uh, enumerated powers? Now, your fillings are the same. You don't, you don't have double fillings. I just put them there in case I was running out of time. I was going to flip through these slides. And you have three chances, actually, to get these two words. If you got them the first time, you're good to go. They're listed there in, in the next slide as well. But if you got them once, you don't have to fill in again. You know what it means by uh, the, the, the U.S. Constitution expressly grants the federal government only the limited powers that are listed, numbered, and ascribed to it in the Constitution. That's all the government has. They can't make up anything else. <laughs> This means, what enumerated means, it means that it's, if there's a specific list of what the government can do. If it's not listed, then the government what? Can't do it. Cannot do it. So that means, that, is the EPA in the Constitution, I've never read the Environmental Protection Agency, have you? No. Nope. What about Department of Energy? No. Nope. Health and Human Services? No. Nope. Department of Education? No. Nope. All right, the rule of construction of the Constitution. You can't make an amendment that violates any other right. When government oversteps its bounds, it's violating one of my rights. We should rename the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, the, the, the Employment of the EPA. I have a lot of terms for these things. Well, it means they don't let you work, agency. What is EP? Oh, the Economic Prevention Agency. And you know what? That's stealing from me. Martin Luther King said, if a man won't let me work, he's saying I have no right to eat. Mm. And if he's saying I have no right to eat, he's saying I have no right to exist. That's right. And that's what government is doing with these, with these unconstitutional agencies. Guess what? 
Let's look at amendment number 10 at the bottom. States and people have rights not expressly given to the federal government, which has limited powers. So when people talk about limited government, they're talking about keeping government within the confines of the list that is given to it to do within the US Constitution. Does that make any sense? Yes. Now, here is, I told you don't write this one. Oh, this is a new one. This is a new one. You do have this fill in. The Bill of Rights limits government, but the Bible empowers people. Look at what Thomas Jefferson says. Look what Tommy says. Tommy says a Bill of Rights is what the people are entitled to against who? Yep. Government. The Bill of Rights represent the Founding Fathers' Ten Commands to Government. In the Constitution, they said people pursue life, liberty, and happiness. If you read the Federalist Papers and some other things, they'll say within the confines of the Ten Commandments, within the parameters of the Ten Commandments. And it turns to government and it gives them this list of Bill of Rights. The Bill of Rights are the Founding Fathers' version of the Ten Commandments to government. Everywhere I go, I was in Malaysia last month, or two or three weeks ago, and last week I was in London. Everywhere I went, when people said, Mr. Walsh, what's going on with the world? Why is America turning its back on all the principles that made it great? People from every country on the planet, practically. Well, many countries. Anyway, I, when I say to them that the American government is founded on the Ten Commandments, and the people that are ruining America are basing their value system on ten precepts that are the opposite of the Ten Commandments, and that those ten precepts became the ten planks of the Communist Manifesto, I don't get any arguments. Mm. That's a talking point. Mm -hmm. Nobody argues with that. Now, some people may say, and I know these people can't even probably quote three of the Ten Commandments, but they instinctively know that that's true. Everyone around the world believes that there's something wholesome, good, and very, very different about the United States of America. Mm -hmm. I'll pull the mic up closer. I can hear it fading also. So there, everybody knows that America is something different. When I go to other countries, you can be dressed in any kind of you know, clothing you want. If they think you've got something under, under your, your, your robes, they got you spread equal and they're frisking you. I was, I was with some people and they said, hey, why don't you come with us and hang out in the first class lounge? I said, they're not going to let me hang out in the first class lounge in a strange country where I don't have a ticket to go in there. And they said, you're an American. They're going to let you do what you want. I'm, I'm not. I said, how so? They said, they know you people don't blow yourselves up. Come on, come on. You know why? Because of Christianity, Americans have an aversion to suicide. Mm -hmm. And you can't twist, you, you, at least, there's one thing you ha have a hard time twisting us to do, and that's convincing us that murder is good. Except when it comes to little unborn babies. But most Americans won't kill themselves. So this is what Thomas Jefferson says. A Bill of Rights is what we are entitled to to keep the government in check. Oh, look at what he said at the bottom about the uh, Bible being the cornerstone. See that? The Bible stone is the cornerstone of liberty. Students' perusal of the sacred volume will make us better citizens, better fathers, and better husbands. That was on one of my previous slides as well. Let's see if you have a fill in here. We don't have one here. But American culture resulted from the application of biblical benefits. I was doing a gun rights forum with Senator Sampson uh, out of uh, Brooklyn in New York City. I have a friend, his name is uh, John Wallace. He's a six foot five inch white retired state trooper. So he said to Senator Sampson, can I bring my brother Earl to the forum? And so I walk in and obviously, because I'm black, they think I'm liberal. So we got the million moms and you got some other people there. And so I said, John, I said, you sit at one end and I'll sit at the other. And we'll, we'll, we'll be the bookend, the brother bookends to the uh, liberals. Anyway, um, one of the people addressing the panel said to me, well, you expect everybody to live as Christians. I said, no. Well, what you're saying about the biblical basis of the Bill of Rights, it can't work for me because I'm not a Christian. I said, it works for you. You've been enjoying it all your life. You don't have to be a Bible-believing Christian to have the benefits of Christianity when it's applied to government. You've been living in that all your life. And those people, they were complaining about crime in their community, and I told the men, you are letting yourself be castrated, because you know you're supposed to be protecting your family. You instinctively know it, and you're letting yourself be castrated by this gun rights stuff. Of all the systems of morality, ancient or modern, which have come under my observation, none appear as pure to me as that of Jesus. Yeah. That's what Thomas Jefferson said. Now they're going to tell us that this man was a deist. Meaning, oh, well, he believed in God, but he didn't really believe. We're going to see how much Thomas Jefferson believed in a bit. Look at Ben Franklin. These are, Thomas Jefferson and Ben Franklin are reputed to be the two most unbelieving of the founding fathers. Look what Ben Franklin said. He wrote this to the French ministry in 1778. 
Whoever shall introduce into public affairs the principles of primitive Christianity will change the face of the world. In my third presentation, I parallel the American Revolution with the French Revolution. The founding fathers rejected the values of enlightenment. Enlightenment was nothing more than the 10 precepts uh, being implemented into art and, and, and whatever else they got their hands on at the time. That's why there's so many pictures of naked people during that time. And they want to call it art. It's just perversion. I don't care if it's 300 years old. I'm not going to look at it. Come on. Now you got three fill-ins here. I wrote a book called The Three-Dimensional Leader, Negotiating Your Mission, Resources, and Context. But you've got to write mission, context, and resources. Government's mission is to administer policies within the context of the U.S. Constitution to empower we the people as our chief, as our nation's chief resources. I see I left an apostrophe out there. What's government's goal, role? Government is to facilitate a set of circumstances that are favorable for we the people to use our gifts, abilities, and talents and the environmental materials that God gives us, to pro that God provides us, so that we can innovate goods and services that other people want to pay us a profitable price to enjoy. I was doing a book signing event with one of my alma maters, SUNY Albany, and the head of the business program is, got, got up in front of me. He was a, I, was, I was a book between these two guys, and uh, one was the uh, head of the business department, and the other one was, had just written a book on sulfur. He wrote a, like a 600-page book on all the uh, chemical uh, values and properties. Oh, I'm sorry, it was garlic, on garlic. But he told me his main uh, business is sulfur. He writes on sulfur. He said there's not a major company in the world that, has not used, that, does, that, does, not use, that does not use sulfur or uses sulfur in its, in its manufacturing processes that he has not, um, that he has not uh, consulted with. Anyway, the business guy. The business guy has to get up and, and, and give a defense of capitalism. I was stunned. And so I, he comes back and he sit, stand beside me and said, you have to defend capitalism? He said, you have no idea. And after having people come to my book table that day, I realized, wow, we gotta defend capitalism. So that's why these statements are in there. Use your gifts and your abilities and your, ta and your talents to innovate goods and services that other people want to pay you a profitable price to enjoy. Can't go into that right now, but I'm working on an economics program. Anyway, what's functional versus dysfunctional government? Functional government, you have a fill in there, what is it? Dysfunctional. Dysfunctional government is when the government violates the Ten Commands or the Bill of Rights. Because all functional relationships are those in which the behaviors of the partners conform to what? The? Same command. And all dysfunctional relationships are which the behaviors of at least one of the partners violates the? Same command. And it's functional versus dysfunctional relationships, and it applies to government too. All right? John Jay, the first Supreme Court Justice, said Americans should prefer? Which is your fill-in, as their rulers. The exact quote is, Providence has given to our people the choice of their rulers. And it is the duty as well as the privilege and interest of our Christian nation. Notice he said, Christian nation? What is that all about? Why is he calling us a Christian nation? To prefer Christians for their rulers. You don't have two fill-ins. I just gave you the word twice in case you missed the first one. So Jay wrote this to a letter to Jedediah Morris in 1797. But let's see what he's talking about. Do you know that in 1799 and in 1892... 100 years apart, roughly, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled America is a Christian nation. In 1799, the Supreme Court ruled that by our form of government, the Christian religion is the established religion, referencing how the American form of government is intertwined with biblical philosophy. When people say, oh, you're just trying to force your religion on me, I said, it's not religion, it's called the biblical philosophy of Christianity. And if you don't like Christianity, the word Christianity, this is called biblical philosophy. You know, the Bible's a history book, and it tells you some other stuff, but it's a forward-looking book as well. In 1892, the case of the Church of the Holy Trinity versus the United States, the Supreme Court examined hundreds of state constitutions. The Church of the Holy Trinity took the federal government to court and said, we are a Christian nation. And the Supreme Court ruled and said, yep, you're right. They looked at um, historical documents, and they concluded America is a religious Christian nation. You know, the, the atheists were attacking even back then. That's why 11 years after the ratification of the U.S. Constitution, we have these court cases. All right, here's what, the, here's what more, more significantly, though, let's focus on the 1892 case. The U.S. Supreme Court examined hundreds of the Founding Fathers' documents. They, they, they examined all the state constitutions, 
Every state had a constitution. They examined it. All the constitutions mentioned God, except Rhode Island's. And they concluded that America has a Christian foundation. Here's what they said. This is the court. This is the, this, these are the words of the Supreme Court. There's a universal language pervading them all, like people saying, praise God. Hallelujah. They affirm and reaffirm that this is a religious nation. There's quotes of the Ten Commandments and how God's providence helped our nation and brought the pilgrims here and all that. These are not individual sayings, declarations of private individuals. They are organic utterances. They speak the language of the entire people. These and many other matters which might be noticed add a volume of unofficial declarations to the mass of organic utterances that this is a Christian nation. Are you with me? Let's talk about the constitutional role of the American church. If the founding fathers based the constitution upon the Bible and the Ten Commandments, what entity would the founding fathers have expected to be the, 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 the purveyor of that information to America? The church. Freedom of religion. Amendment number one. Amendment number one. You gotta get this. It conjoins five rights. That's why I give, you know why I give you these, these papers? Because I don't want to trust anything to your memories. You hold on to these papers I'm giving you. You take them home, and when you get assignments in school, you refer to the papers. You go to Camp Constitution and you email me. I'll help you write your papers. The Bible says that one man seems right, or a woman, man, until the next man gets up to speak. I intend to be that next man. Amen. Now, free, the, the, the amendment number one conjoins five rights. If the founding fathers wanted to separate the church and state, they would have made five amendments. But they made one amendment. It's just got five fingers. The first finger is freedom of religion. So that you can practice biblical Christianity open, openly versus what I call the social gospel. We're going to go into that at the end. Freedom of speech. Publicly proclaim Christianity. Freedom of the press to promote Judeo-Christian values. Freedom to assemble, peaceably assemble. That means whole church and Bible studies everywhere. Do you know that Thomas Jefferson and Benjamin Franklin, the two people who we are told are the most unbelieving of the founding fathers, started a church in the halls of Congress yeah. at which 5,000 to 8,000 people attended every week. Yeah. Freedom to redress the government, bring grievances to the government, remedy the situation by dragging it back to the biblical basis of the Bill of Rights. There's a fill in here, it's the word conscience, conscience, con The founding fathers expected the Bible to be the conscience, the conscience, and guide of social life and government. That's why in the First Amendment they said, practice religion publicly. Christianity is specifically what they had in mind. They didn't practice anything else. Just showed you some quotes. Speak openly about religion. That, again, Christianity being specifically what they had in mind. Assemble freely to promote biblical studies in churches and biblical values. Publish Christianity everywhere. Do you know that uh, by architectural design, our buildings in Washington, D.C. have Bible verses carved into them? That's right. They didn't go with scotch tape or, you know, post-it notes and put them up afterwards. They're there by architectural design. It's carved in stone in the buildings. So how can somebody say we're not a Christian nation? You know, anyway. And they said, publish uh, about religion or Christianity in all forms of the media. And if government strays, once again, drag them back onto God's path. I keep repeating this because I want to stick with you. Here's another way of looking at it. The First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution communicates that freedom rests upon, uh, freedom, freedom rests upon rights that are guided by religion. So you got religion, then speech, then press. is like going around the clock, assembly, redress. What do you redress the government about? Because they strayed from religion. What should guide your speech? Religion. What should guide what's wholesome in the press? Religion. What should, why should we assemble? So we can practice religion. You with me? You got a fill in here. You got two. What are they? Stable and values. Stable and values. The Ten Commandments are the values that motivated our traditions. The U.S. became a cohesive, unified, stable, and productive society because people, including politicians, treated each other according to the values of the Ten Commandments and other biblical values. Now, when people tell me separation of church and state, I say, you're acting as if any organization gets to be an organization without a mission, without a vision, and without some values that guide it. 
we just showed you what the mission, vision, and the mission and vision were, are of the United States. The values are the Ten Commandments. No, when we when we go in and do organizational training, we do mission, vision, and values. Well, the values of the of America are the Ten Commandments. I don't get any arguments when I tell people that. Now, check this out. Business is facilitated when people decide not to steal from each other. All the concepts that we talk about in business, win-win, they all come from biblical concepts. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. Mistakes are overcome when people decide to turn the other cheek. All organizations are built on love and forgiveness, I say in my training programs. And to do unto others as you want others to do unto us. However, my training programs also say a lot of other things about how you discipline bad employees. You know, the ones that are vampires. Some of you heard a little bit about that today. Anyway, Daniel Webster on America's necessity to adhere to the Bible. If we abide by the principles taught in the Bible, our country will go on prospering and to prosper. But if we, in our posterity, those who come after us, are, neglect its instructions and authority, no man can tell how sudden a catastrophe may overwhelm us and bury all of our glory in profound obscurity. Churches were to keep the government on track. The concept of free churches as established by the Founding Fathers in the First Amendment safeguarded America by ensuring Bible expository churches will be free and independent, the objective voice needed to keep the government on track in line with the foundational truths explained in the Declaration of Independence, which mentions God four times. The church is the minister of grace under, uh, uh, under God's law to individuals, while the state is the minister of justice to administer God's laws and civil affairs, consistent with God's laws. Don't make up laws. Keep the God's laws. They are embedded in the Bill of Rights. The state should be run by those who have received God's grace and are submitted to it. I have people, we've got, I got a guy running for Congress up my way, and he's a born again Christian, he's an elder at a local church. He, he and I were in sister churches years ago. And so, and he's a real elder, but the other Christians and the other petard people didn't believe it. So anyway, so I said to them, we gotta only vote for people who, who, who fear God and, and adhere. We gotta vote for Ten Commandments people. Right. If I'm a Ten Commandments uh, Democrat, the, the evil side will find a Ten Precepts Democrat and they'll run a primary against me. Right. If I'm a Ten Commandments Republican, the other side is going to try to find a Ten Precepts Republican uh -huh. and run a primary against me. Okay. So we can get away from talking about Republicans and Democrats. Right. We just need people that will adhere to the Ten Commandments. Right. Now, what are free churches? America had free churches between 1620 and 1954. From 1620 to 1954, churches in America functioned as what the Founding Fathers called free churches. That's why they said in the First Amendment, Congress shall make no law respecting or prohibiting. We're going to leave them alone. They're free. And, they did, and, we, and the church did so very successfully, evangelizing each successive generation in an ever-growing number of churches and denominations. A free church operates independent of and is in no way subordinate to the civil government. It's free and empowered to be God's independent voice in the world. Here's evidence of our Christian, that we were a Christian nation, and that we are. It's on almost every corner in every little town in America, and it's certainly in every cemetery. Drive around any little town in America, and you'll see all these churches, corner after corner after corner churches, but they say, oh, we weren't a Christian nation. If we weren't, why are there so many churches? I think people have heard me say this on YouTube, so now we're trying to knock churches down. What's your feeling? Churches. If there were 100 people in the community, there were at least two churches, unless the Christians really didn't get along there, it might be three or four. You ever go to a cemetery? Life and death. We always put the most important things about us on our tombstones. And they're all crosses. They're all about how we need salvation. How Jesus on the cross, God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself. It's not bad, it's just me. I'm going to just tighten this down here. So do you know that our um, America, as, as Colin Powell and many other famous people have said, and military people have said, the only land that America has ever asked for in exchange for liberating the world from tyranny is the land it required to bury our dead. And you go overseas, on the right-hand side, there's a cemetery here, I believe it's in France, look at that. Crosses line the field as far as the eye can see. There are no other type, there's some stars of David and things like that, but for the most part, there are no Buddhist wheels of righteousness. 
There's no, you know, no. They're, they're all acknowledging Christianity. Now, um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna. Let me see if I can touch on this free church thing. We're not gonna do that. The American church did a good job. I'm getting the five minute sign here. The American church did a good job of keeping our nation's politicians, judges, and public servants accountable to administrator offices consistent with the biblical basis of Bill of Rights until in 1954, a wonderful communist and a sinner named Senator Lyndon Baines Johnson developed the IRS 501c3 policy. In his, in his election to become, um, we most know him as the vice president under John F. Kennedy, and then he became the president once Kennedy got killed. But we, we, we don't know about him, uh, or it's more obscure, is that he was a uh, senator, and when he won his bid to Congress, he won by 90 votes statewide. In those days, all the polling places were in churches and schools, and the churches screamed bloody murder. They said, we didn't vote for this guy. This is voter fraud. 90 votes statewide. The papers nicknamed him Landslide Johnson. You know, oh, he won by such a landslide. The first thing Glendon Baines Johnson does is when he gets to Congress, he goes, I'm going to get the... I'm going to get church, the church out of my corrupt business of politics. And he goes to the IRS and he connives the 501c3 policy. They probably put him up to it, but he was the one that introduced it. The founding fathers called churches free churches. They never taxed them. And so he says, well, you can keep your tax exemption as long as you stop talking about politics, which is a violation of our First Amendment rights. If I could spit on the floor, I would say, on that. I'm not going to stop talking. I'm not going to stop exercising my First Amendment rights to get a tax exemption. Right. I had a friend and she got very, very sick and she needed a few thousand dollars and someone said, no, you should give her the money this way, then you'll get a tax exemption. I said, I'm not going to let the government dictate to me what I do with my money. Tax no. exemption or no tax exemption. If I want to give somebody some money, I'm going to give somebody some money. Now, since 1954, the IRS, through subterfuge, has undermined the churches that now are challenged to think freely. The opposite of a free church is a state church. And in 1954, under 501 c3 churches began operating as an underling of the state as tax-exempt, non-profit religious corporations. They even make the churches sometimes a tax collector for the government. Politicians now grab the, the issues the, the Bible grab issues the Bible calls sin and makes them political issues, and the church steps back away from them or avoids them. No more stepping back. The phrase separation of church and state is what? Not found in the Bible. There's your fill-in. Instead, it appears in a letter that, uh, there's your other fill-in, letter written in 1802 by Thomas Jefferson. You know, he wrote a letter to the Baptists in uh, Danbury, Connecticut. The Baptists were very concerned about Thomas Jefferson. What were they concerned about? Thomas Jefferson didn't have anything to do with religion, did he? Why would they be concerned about Thomas Jefferson? Well, he was practicing religion so much that they were afraid that as president, he was going to force everybody into his version of Christianity. That's how unreligious he was. They were worried that he was going to enforce his brand of Christianity on all of America because he didn't believe anything. You get that? You understand the significance of that? The churches were worried that Thomas Jefferson was going to make them practice his brand of Christianity. And now we're supposed to be told that he didn't believe. Oh, President Jefferson assured them that there is a wall of separation that keeps the government from going over it. Remember, a listed and enumerated rights? The government can't interfere with that. The phrase never implied that the state needed to be protected from the church. Jefferson was ensuring us that the church has the benefit of a wall of protection from the government. Well, they, un they connived and undermined that in 1954. The First Amendment says Congress shall make no law establishing a national religion. That's basically what it's all about. I'm going to keep moving here. You got a fill in here? It's called ban. You know, since the U.S. Constitution is based on the Bible and the enemies of America, they want to violate the U.S. Constitution, which is based on the Bible. So what do they have to do first? They, got us, they have to stop us from reading the Bible. So that we don't know that when they violate the Bill of Rights, they're also violating God's will for how, people, how he wants people to live. The three-dimensional leader, a book I once read, says you can't violate our processes without violating our values. Already did that. Um, many government policies injure people. Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin are not relief, 
not you're going to get a break today, they're dead. Hey, do you think teaching evolution and denying creation is a form of death? Yes. Denying people God. Jesus said, let the little children come to me. And they're forbidding the children to come to him through school. Mm -hmm. What about moving prayer from schools? Is that injuring people? Yes. All right. Telling people you can't pray. What's wrong with that? Everybody needs to pray. So God made us to pray. Abortion. You think that's hurting people? Oh, yeah. It's hurting both the person they're yanking the baby out of as well as killing the fetus. The child. Sex education without biblical education and discipline. You think that's going to hurt people? Yeah. What about homosexuality? You think that's going to hurt people? Oh, yeah. What about dependence upon government welfare that provides wealth without responsibility or accountability? The Bible says in 2 Thessalonians 3.10, if you don't work, you don't eat. What person gets up in the morning and says, man, I'm going to have a great day on welfare today. That's my ambition in life. I mean, after a couple of generations, that's what happens to people. But that's not, that's not our goal for our lives. I was raised on welfare. I told my oldest sister when I was like 10 or 11 years old, I said, I, said, I don't know what a family is, but I'm going to find out. And I do know one thing. I'm not doing this to my family. Now, only the application of scripture to man's specific needs is what transforms lives. Not a half gospel of hyper grace. Love, 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 love everybody. Doesn't matter what to do, we're going to love you. You'll make ourselves a doormat doing stuff like that, you know? In the 1954 501c3 policy causes the church to do what? From its original role of guiding government politics and civil affairs. No more withdrawing. The Bible says my people perish from a lack of knowledge. Let's not be deceived by anybody who raises their hand and says, I'm going to take care of the poor. Yeah, okay. Right? Mao Zedong did that. Hitler did that. Stalin and Lenin did that. Pol Pot did that. Idi Amin even did it. Every bad guy does that. They say, I'm going to take care of the poor. And then while well, they got a, an army behind them, they take everything from everybody. You know? All right. Now, politicians grab these issues, and, uh, and they call them political ones. But we know that there's sin. Right. You know, the only thing a state church has to offer the world is the social gospel. We're going to make a food pantry. I've had churches contact me and say, hey, can, we, can you help us get a government grant? And I'm like, well, why would we want to do that? Well, we want to make a food pantry downtown. And will the government let you preach the gospel? No, 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 but we'll make friends with the people. And we'll, we'll, we'll kind of, you know, they'll call us back and we'll, we'll make friends with them and we'll be able to tell them the gospel that way. I said, the Bible says that faith comes by what? Hearing. Hearing. Doesn't come by feeding people. It does not come by osmosis. It doesn't come by you making friends with me. The Bible says that faith comes by hearing. Now, being friends may give me an opportunity to be heard better. It may give me some validity with you. But if the government won't let you preach the gospel, trust me, you don't want the government's money. The social gospel says that um, if I obey, if I feed people, this is what the social gospel says. It says if, if, the, if, the, if the government is noble and it takes care of the poor, then everybody in the society is noble and righteous in God's sight. That's why New York City Mayor de Blasio says this at the top of the slide. He thinks he's going to sail through the pearly gates of heaven because he's trying to limit someone else's sugar intake and the size of their soft drink. Boy, is that holy and righteous and noble. Such a notion is utterly foolish and represents Satan's sleight of hand through the social gospel. You may feel good about it. That's why the people that want to take care of the environment. Oh, man, I'm doing something righteous and religious. I tell people, you've got to go worship God and stop worshiping grass. Uh -huh, come on. Don't mow your lawn for the rest of the summer and see how much the grass needs your help. Mm -hmm. I have to fight the seed in my garage every year, otherwise a tree will grow up in my garage and break my garage apart. Nature does not need your help. Go worship God and stop that. Such righteousness, middle of the page, is filthy rags, says in Isaiah. I'm going to skip that. I'm just going to get to your last film. I'm trying to remember what it is. How do we restore ourselves? Ulysses S. Grant says this. Let's read the bold. My advice to Sunday schools, no matter what the denomination is, is hold fast to the Bible as the sheet anchor of your liberties. Write its precepts on your hearts and practice them in your lives. To the influence of this book, we are indebted for all the progress made in true civilization. You know what? They stopped teaching Western civilization in schools. They used to teach it in high school. They used to teach it in college. You know what Western civilization is? It's how Christianity civilized the world. Yeah, that's right. And America became the, the epitome of that. Second Chronicles 7.14. Here's your filling. It's on the bottom turn. 
God offers us an if-then proposition in 2 Chronicles 7.14. Right. He says if we humble ourselves, if we pray, if we seek his face and turn from our wicked ways, we do those four things. He said he'll do three, which includes heal their land. Which, isn't that your last filling on the page? Yes. Okay. So, Camp Constitution, hands up. Hit the deck. Prayer check. Lord, we just thank you for being a great and awesome God. We thank you for this camp. We pray, Father, that you would let these... Lessons that we're learning sink into our hearts and our minds, that you would stir us up and make us the kind of people, God, who could tell these truths to the people around us, the school at work and at play. We ask these things in Jesus' name, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Amen.